Occupational English test. Practice test two. Listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you will hear this sound. You will have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you will hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you will have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you will hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract one. Extract one, questions one to twelve. You hear a cardiologist talking to a patient called Jessica Saunders. For questions one to twelve, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. Hello, Mrs. Sanders. I'm the doctor in charge. I just wanted to let you know what's happened and answer any questions you may have. What is cyanosis? Is it an infection? Not quite. Cyanosis refers to a bluish colour to the skin and the mucous membranes. Peripheral cyanosis is when there is a bluish discoloration to the hands or feet. It's usually caused by low oxygen levels in the red blood cells or problems getting oxygenated blood to the body. You see, blood that's rich in oxygen is the bright red colour that you usually associate with blood. When blood has a lower level of oxygen and becomes darker red, bluer light is reflected, making the skin appear to have a blue tint. My baby has that. One of the medics did a hypoxia test to see if the PaO2 would rise or something. And she said it failed to rise, which means the bluish colour is probably due to a cyanotic heart disease. Yes, that's correct. We have determined that this is probably the case. How much do you know about your baby's condition? Just that her lips were blue, and it was probably due to a cyanotic heart disease. That's all. Okay. Well, firstly, let me reassure you that we are taking very, very good care of her.、Uh, we've treated your baby as an emergency case, as we should. We've already started the emergency treatment, and I'm here to update you. I have reviewed your baby's X-rays, and I can see abnormal positioning of the two main blood vessels. Thus, it's likely that your baby has what's known as a transposition of the great arteries. Do you know what that is? No. Can you tell me what it is? Transposition of the great arteries is a serious condition where the two main blood vessels leaving the heart, the pulmonary artery which carries blood to the lungs to absorb oxygen. And the aorta, which takes blood from the heart to the body, are swapped over. That's to say, the pulmonary artery is joined to the left pumping chamber and the aorta to the right pumping chamber. This means that blood flows to the lungs and picks up oxygen, but is then pumped back to the lungs instead of travelling around the body. Blood flowing around the body is unable to reach the lungs to pick up oxygen and continue circulating. So. Because they're in the wrong way round, she's not getting enough oxygen to her body. She is getting some oxygen thanks to another blood vessel、um, connecting the main pulmonary artery to the aorta, but this is not enough. That's why she looks cyanotic or all blue. How common is this? Transposition of the great arteries accounts for up to five percent of congenital heart disease, and it's the most common、uh, cardiological cause of cyanosis in newborns. And how, how is it being treated? 
We started a prostaglandin medicine to keep the ducts open because it closes naturally after birth. We will also need to do a balloon atrial septostomy, which is a surgical procedure in which a small hole is created between the upper two chambers of the heart, the atria. This will improve the mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood at the atrial level, but ultimately an atrial switch operation will need to be performed to provide a definitive correction. But one of your doctor colleagues listened to her and said that there were no murmurs. And I wanted to ask what that is, but they were gone by the time I could. Murmurs? Well, that's that sound, that whooshing or swishing sound. They can be harmless or innocent. Um, harmless murmurs may not cause symptoms um, and can happen when blood flows more rapidly than normal. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a dentist talking to a patient called Chrissy White. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. What brings you here today, Chrissy? Extreme pain. <laughs> it's not that bad, is it? It started with a numbing pain a few months back. I didn't think much of it, and in fact, when I came back here then, the dentist sent me away with a bit of penicillin. Yes, I did see that x-ray from the visit. It's a shame the antibiotics didn't do the trick. No, and now the pain's flaring up again. What causes it? Anything and everything, it seems. It's mainly when I drink something hot, but it also happens if I eat something cold, like ice cream. I see. What type of pain is it? Like a sharp pain all over my teeth. Oh dear. With it being a wisdom tooth, it seems that we may have to look at taking it out. Take it out? I'd rather have a filling if possible, and not one of those metal ones. Silver amalgam? Yeah, not one of those. The ones that look tooth-like. Ordinarily, it is possible to have composite resin filling. How does that work? Well, I would need to use a local anaesthetic to numb the area around your tube. Then I'd use one of those air abrasion instruments over there to remove the decay. After that, the area needs to be cleaned of any bacteria and debris so that I can see if the decay has reached the root. We've got to protect the nerve, you see. But when there's enough of a space, I can then add the filling. A little bit of a finish and polish and we're done. That doesn't sound too bad at all. It's not. I really am very good at the procedure. It's one of the first dental procedures that I learned. But in all honesty, Chrissy, it'd only be a matter of time before you're back here again and in even more pain. So then, what do you suggest? I'm afraid I will still think extraction is the best option. An extraction? Oh, now I'm starting to feel woozy. Oh, don't worry. It's not as major as it sounds. Just like the filling, it's all under the local anaesthetic. Will it hurt? You'd feel a little pinch when the needle goes into your gum and before the anaesthetic kicks in, but that's about it. I'd make sure to numb the tissues surrounding your molar too. I'll even make sure to do some tests around your gums to make sure it's working before we start anything. Thanks. And then? Well, then I have to expand your tooth socket. I'll rock it back and forth so that the bone around it compresses and the socket widens. All of this makes it easier to extract. Would it pop out easily then? Relatively so, with a little help from the pliers. What goes in its place afterwards? Don't tell me I'm going to have a big gaping hole at the back of my mouth. After a few weeks, it's likely the swelling will heal over straight after the procedure. However, it should feel tender. What about straight after? What happens when the anaesthetics wear off? Can you prescribe me some painkillers? Of course. What do you do for work? I'm a receptionist then I'd recommend taking some time off. Sweet. Although bear in mind that eating may be a little difficult after the procedure, but only for a few days or so. While you're waiting for the tooth to heal, we've compiled a list of food suggestions for you. 
anything that's not absolutely rancid. <laughs> There's pudding, gelato, mashed potatoes, scrambled eggs. Not bad. A bit of sorbet or yogurt too. Hmm, this may not be so bad after all. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you will hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions one to six, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question one. You hear an occupational therapist discussing a case study. Now read the question. I was recently asked to do a case study to assess the living needs of a patient that was recently released from hospital care. The patient is a 36-year-old woman with limited mobility. She had recently been involved in a car accident and suffered severe damage to her spine, which resulted in paralysis from the neck down. Whilst this may be temporary, plans have been put in place to provide long-term solutions for her day-to-day -day living needs. The care that she had received post-surgery was exemplary and the patient is now ready to go home. Her mother, in her early 60s, had renovated a downstairs room in her home in order to accommodate her daughter, and a full-time carer has been appointed. The equipment and staff management required to provide the patient with the utmost care has been put in place. I will follow up with a visit to the patient in two weeks' time, where she will have had further follow-up appointments with the medical professionals. Now look at question two. You hear the Director of Nursing and Head of Resourcing, discussing recruitment. Now read the question. How many nurses are we expecting to join the trust over the next few weeks? Fifteen, and they've all completed their in-country training. I've prepared an induction session on the 8th and more training on the week commencing the 12th. Good, good. Are they all adult nurses? The majority of them are, yes. We've also got one midwife in the group. That's good. Maternity is really short-staffed. Do you think we'll be able to accommodate them on the hospital grounds? Last I checked, everywhere was full. I'll request an increase in the budget from HR and see if we can find them some private accommodation, so long as it's all within 20 minutes commute. It'll be Christmas soon and we need to make sure that we're, you know, covered. I agree. And thank you very much. Do you think you'll need me for the rest of the day or shall I crack on with the project? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Emma. You can go. Now look at question three. You hear two vets discussing a journal article. Now read the question. Hey, have you seen this article? What is it? It's about gene therapy in dogs. Just have a look. It says, for decades, gene therapy has been envisaged as a way to cure disease by introducing new genetic material into people's DNA. Can you believe they're doing that? Hmm, I, I don't know. That's, I, I'm not sure about gene therapy and stuff, it seems. Yeah, I mean, it's brand new tech. Uh, I mean, it is actually showing some success. Um, treatments are moving closer to approval in the States, for example. Um, some of these therapies were first tested in researched dogs that have immune systems that are similar to us. So they're putting, basically, they're using medical advancement for dogs, is what you're saying? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. But, you know, we're looking for better care for our, you know, furry 
family members, essentially, and these therapies will soon be on the market. Wow. Now look at question four. You hear an optometrist with a new machine. Now read the question. I wanted to talk to you today about one of the most common pieces of technology used by optometrists in an eye examination, the ferropter. It is a common name for an ophthalmic testing device, also called a refractor. It is used to detect and measure an individual's refractive error, such as nearsightedness, farsightedness, or an astigmatism. It contains different lenses used by refraction of the eye during sight testing. Typically, the patient sits behind the ferropter and looks through it at an eye chart. The chart is placed 6 metres away to test general sight, and then closer at 40 centimetres for those that need reading glasses. Lenses and other settings can be changed by the optometrist. After each setting is adjusted, they will ask the patient to respond honestly about which of the setups are providing the best vision. If a patient is unable to respond verbally to the eye care professional, for reasons such as being an infant or not being able to speak the same language, something called a retinoscope is used through the theropter to measure the vision without the need to communicate. Now look at question five. You hear a podiatrist research. Now read the question. This study has been looking at lateral ankle sprains predominantly in people that play sports and also dancers. Um, it's been looking at the management and treatment options for this problem. And there are a range of treatments from doing absolutely nothing to immobilisation to surgery. It has been found that once you've suffered a lateral ankle sprain once, you are more likely to suffer them in the future and also have ongoing ankle instability. This isn't really dealt with um, very well or very much um, at the moment. So this study aims to provide a grounding to improve that in the future, whether that be um, treatment for the initial lateral ankle sprain or management to prevent future lateral ankle sprains and recurrent ankle instability. Now look at question six. You hear members of a hospital committee discussing issues on the ward. Now read the question. As you all know, we've gathered here to discuss a shortage of beds in A&E and the recent CQC inspection. Ellie, would you like to start us off? Of course. I'll start with the latter. As you're aware, we've received a rating of good and overall the inspectors were of the opinion that the service is performing well and meeting expectations. We were assessed on our management team whether our service is safe, effective, responsive and whether staff provided care that promote compassion, kindness, dignity and respect. It's worth a note that we could have reached an outstanding rating, but for the inspectors, opinion of the shortage of beds. Right. Does anyone have any suggestions on what we can do to improve this particular metric? We can take the minister's approach and tell patients to sit on seats in the unit while they wait for bed. OK. Any other suggestions? That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you will hear two extracts. In each extract, you will hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 7 to 22, choose the answer A, B or C.
which fits best according to what you hear. Now look at extract one. Extract one. Question seven to 14. You hear a doctor, Quinton Carver, giving a lecture on neurological conditions. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 7 to 14. Hello, my name is Quentin Carver, and I'm a specialist in neurological conditions. I am here today to discuss the topic of Parkinson's disease, which has the potential to act as a significant strain on the resources of the NHS in the coming years. Parkinson's disease is a condition in which parts of the brain become progressively damaged over many years. Parkinson's disease is caused by a loss of nerve cells in part of the brain called the substantia nigra. This leads to a reduction in a chemical called dopamine in the brain. Dopamine plays a vital role in regulating the movement of the body, and the loss of dopamine provides many of the symptoms associated with Parkinson's. Parkinson's is a common disease in the UK, affecting approximately 145,000 people, with the 120,000 of those living in England. Ultimately, its current prevalence rate means that it affects 1 in 500 people in the UK. Little is known about what causes the loss of nerve cells, and thus the loss of dopamine. But scientists have speculated that it could be due to a combination of genetics and environmental factors. Parkinson's is a disease where its prevalence increases with age. 95% of sufferers develop the disease when they are over 40, with a majority developing the disease when they are over 50. Approximately 1 in every 20 people with Parkinson's would have developed the disease before they were 40. The symptoms of Parkinson's disease are relatively easy to identify. The three most common symptoms exhibited are involuntary shaking of particular body parts, known as tremors, slow movement, and stiff and inflexible muscles. These symptoms tend to worsen with time. Although every patient dies with Parkinson's, it is never the direct cause of death. There is often an incorrect diagnosis with cases of Parkinson's disease. In 2016, approximately 25% of all Parkinson's diagnoses were incorrect. There are several treatments that can delay or reduce the effects the disease has on the sufferer. One such treatment is taking prescribed medication. The most commonly supplied drug is levodopa, which is a natural drug that helps to increase the dopamine levels in a patient. Parkinson's has other great support systems in place due to charities set up by famous celebrities who suffer from the illness. For example, the Michael J. Fox Foundation suggests that one of the best ways in which to combat the symptoms of illness is to exercise. The foundation highly recommends running, swimming, or yoga. Other useful means to combat the effects of the illness are stress reduction techniques and talking to other sufferers. Parkinson's disease has significant funding around it from the Parkinson's community. In the UK, Parkinson's UK has managed to raise £85 million since its inception whilst the Michael J. Fox Foundation has raised in excess of £800 million to help accelerate the process of finding a cure. Although Parkinson's disease will not kill you, 
Some of the hazards that are caused by the symptoms can lead to death or significant injury. For example, loss of balance can lead to a dangerous fall, whilst pneumonia is a common side effect which can be fatal. These unknown and unpredictable side effects mean many Parkinson's sufferers live in constant fear. This need not be the case if the UK government continues to fund research activities and administer clinical trials. This combined with the brilliant work of charities will bring an accelerated end to the fear of Parkinson's. Now look at extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 15 to 22. You hear a nurse, Claire Alexander, giving a presentation on lifestyle and well-being. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 15 to 22. Hello, my name is Claire Alexander and I'm a nurse practitioner specialising in lifestyle well-being. My topic today is an increasingly important issue, obesity and lifestyle decisions in teenagers and children. Childhood obesity in the UK is a significant issue. Of children between the ages 2 to 15, nearly a third are overweight or obese. This is a problem due to the associated health risks that often accompany obesity. Furthermore, obesity is an expensive health-related issue, costing the UK government a total of £5.1 billion, and thus child obesity is a significant health and economic issue. The primary issue associated with child obesity, however, are the associated health risks that come later in life. As an obese adult, you are seven times more likely to become a type 2 diabetic than an adult of average weight. Type 2 diabetes can lead to limb amputation and blindness. Obesity as an adult increases the risk of heart disease and doubles the risk of a premature death, whilst simultaneously increasing the likelihood you will suffer a mental health illness. The problem begins in childhood and throughout primary school, where the number of severely obese children leaving school was 60% higher than those beginning school. In 2017, over 22,000 children were classified as severely obese, a BMI in the 99.6th percentile. Obesity is caused by a variety of variables, such as background, livelihood and lifestyle, but it is fundamentally driven by eating too much of the wrong food and failure to exercise adequately. For example, a 330ml soft drink can take a child over their daily allowance of sugar. Statistics such as this have led to the government attempting to cut sugar intake for children by 20% through the year 2020, whilst pledging £2 billion to improve the quality of available food within the public sector. A better quality diet is one of the key means to combating childhood obesity, but a recent survey indicated that only 26% of children aged 5 to 16 were eating the recommended five portions of fruit and vegetables per day. That number drops to just 16% for adults aged 16 and over. 
In terms of obesity treatment, the best advice is to recommend a healthy diet and active lifestyle. The UK government recommend that children should get a minimum one hour of physical activity per day. However, there are certain clinical means to encourage weight loss. In 2016, 450,000 items were prescribed for obesity treatment. In particularly high demand were drugs that prevented food fat being absorbed by the body. 450,000 prescriptions in 2016 was a 7% fall from the previous year, which suggests that more people around the UK are turning towards lifestyle changes and government plans in order to tackle obesity. Obesity in the UK has a disturbing trend. Levels of obesity increase with age. Children aged 2 to 10 in the UK had an obesity rate of 23%, a figure that grew to 36% for those aged 11 to 16. This is deeply worrying for a government that has committed billions of pounds towards fixing an obesity crisis in young people. The plans do not seem to be working. Obesity-related illnesses such as heart disease, stroke and cancer continue to rise and cost the government £2.5 billion alone in 2016. The money spent on obesity, coupled with the health implications the issue entails, makes solving the problem one of the UK government's primary initiatives for the next 10 years. The money spent on obesity could fund 222,000 new teachers – 160,000 nurses and 80,000 doctors. Such statistics must be acted upon with the utmost urgency. That is the end of the listening test.